to uh, learn about redistricting, um, why, why this state needs it, um, how to bring it about, and uh, how to make this more, a more responsive government at both the federal and the state levels. Councilman Curtis Jones, Jr., 4th District. Governor Wolf's invitation to learn more about the redistricting and then anti gerrymandering efforts is of interest to me. Uh, the process of gerrymandering goes back to the post-Civil War days when people were attempting to disenfranchise large groups of people of ethnic background so that they could maintain and reinforce power. So this process continues today. Um, some of the districts, not only at the federal level, but at the state level and at the local level, council districts are so cut up that you could not, you could run a contest to say what streets are in your district and the elected official would fail because of all the left turns, right turns and, and puzzle. Uh, a good friend of mine, Maria Sanchez, has the most gerrymandered district in the United States of America. The, the lines just don't make sense. They discontinue at spots and reconnect at others designed to look at and cherry pick their power base. That's not fair, um, and I'm glad that we are looking at that process today. Well, my name is Jasmine Sessoms, and I am the founder and CEO of an organization called She Can Win. And our mission, we're completely nonpartisan, but we train women to run for office. When you think about gerrymandering, you think that it is an uneven playing field. And some of that comes from the lack of women represented in our government. We truly advocate for all women across both sides of the aisle to get into office because when you have a fair representation, it makes for a better working government. Well, gerrymandering um, is dividing uh, the state up into districts uh, which favor uh, one party over the other, making it very difficult for the minority party to get a foothold and to have its uh, voice in the legislatures. So when I was um, volunteering with Fair District during the primary elections, yes, um, I was talking to one of the volunteers who lives in Lower Marion, and she says the White Evans is her congressman now, and like she has no connection to him, like she didn't understand how he was her congressman. So. Well, Dwight Evans uh, is from Philadelphia, and most of his district is Philadelphia, but not all of his district is Philadelphia. What they did was they took a chunk of uh, Lower Marion and put that in his district. Um, it's not a good service for the people in Lower Marion uh, because their votes, which are predominantly Republican, uh, are going to be overwhelmed by the Philadelphia votes, which are Democrat. And that's a good example of uh, gerrymandering. Uh, welcome. Thank you for coming out tonight like this. Uh, uh, tonight is our, uh, our first meeting of 2018, the Elvis and Neighbors Association. Uh, we have these meetings as part of our core mission of connecting neighbors to uh, various city and state agencies, services, organizations, uh, elected officials, programs, and things like that. Sir, things like funding for our schools, gun violence, infrastructure renewal, shale oil fracking as a revenue source for Pennsylvania's government, just are not getting addressed. Needed laws are not getting passed. Our legislatures right now are very unproductive. So where does gerrymandering come from? And, uh, why do we care about it? Well, the party in power gets to draw the district boundaries to benefit a particular party or a particular candidate. That's what it's about. Uh, Eldridge Gary was the governor of Massachusetts back in 1812, and he got the idea uh, of organizing the state senate in Massachusetts to uh, have boundaries that were favorable to his political party. Uh, one newspaper found out that that was happening, and they wrote a story about it and said the district looked like a salamander. You you can see the district uh, there to the, uh, to the right of uh, Governor Gary. So they named it a gerrymander, but they saw him to do gerrymander. That's where gerrymandering came from. So some of the effects of gerrymandering. It creates safe seats. Now, for example, in the Pennsylvania House in 2016, only 15 of the 203 <coughs> seats that were being elected were competitive. That means they were within 10 percent of the vote in terms of the winner and the loser. Only 15 out of 203. So there's a little turnover in office holders, 
uh, the legislation, legislators are trying to listen less to their constituents and more to people like donors who provide their financial base, the party leaders who can tell them uh, that they will or will not allow the bills they want to propose to pass or give them good seats or chairs or committees, and special interests. Uh, one of that would be lobbyists. So there are very few swing districts remaining. And if the general election is a foregone conclusion because of the gerrymander, then what counts is the primary election. And when you have a contested primary, very few people vote in the primaries. So the people that vote tend to be the hardcore members of the party. Generally speaking, a little bit to the left for the Democrats and a little bit or maybe a long way to the right for the Republicans. So that creates <coughs> people who get elected who are representing those relatively hard positions. They don't understand the need to compromise, they don't understand the idea that there is a middle of the road place uh, where people can meet and get things done. So it pushes the candidates toward the extremes, and you can see that happen both in the Pennsylvania and in the U.S. Congress right now. So the result is you get stalemate, you get dysfunction, uh, voter cynicism and apathy go up, uh, and turn out at the polls. To now here in our own state, we have a gerrymander, a salamander type uh, district, it's the sixth. Uh, the sixth district uh, is Ryan Costello's, and so uh, I'll go on the next step. Shows, uh, shows in blue in the, on, on the screen here. Uh, it's uh, over 50 miles high and over 60 miles wide. Uh, it's uh, anything but contiguous. It's got uh, two cities. It, oh, I should say, by the way, that it votes about 60% Republican, 55 to 60% Republican, and 40 to 45% Democrat, which means it's very, very hard for a Democrat to win an election here. It would be easier if the city of Reddit, which is solidly Democrat, were in that district. But uh, when the districting was done, Reddit was put into the 16th district, which is overwhelmingly Republican. And, and so Reading doesn't really have the voice that you have in elections. If you look at this district, this is the seventh. And look at Coatesville here. Again, a heavily Democratic uh, city that needs attention, uh, but it too has diverged into the 16th. So that the votes don't count the way uh, a vote would count for somebody uh, who's in that county. Thank you. I didn't mean to be first, but I had one question. I'm getting to ask it. We can't get this these bills out of committee. I know one name is Metcalf. I don't know what the other name is. What do we as private citizens do to have the power to get the bills out of committee? That's right. everybody up here that I'm a big mouth but I wouldn't just take over this thing but maybe I could start <coughs> sorry um, this came up yesterday in State College and and um, actually uh, Aristotle <laughs> what a way to start huh? I got you I got you right Aristotle talked about civic virtue as having a measure of shame involved you have to be have a sense of shame and somebody yesterday suggested can I just call up the chair of each of these committees I think it's uh, Metcalf and Fulmer yeah. is that right in the Senate uh, and shame them and say come on this, this is about our democracy I don't care what your political values are or what your partisan identification is we're, we're talking about trying to make our democracy healthier here and and it really gets to the heart of what Aristotle was talking about that it starts with a sense that we actually care what other people think we have that sense of shame so the, the, the person yesterday was suggesting maybe I can just call them up and start shaming them that's what democracy actually is that's part of what it is is to say you shouldn't be doing this you ought to be ashamed of yourself for creating maps like this so let's start with that uh, the other thing I'd, I'd say is in a democracy, the governor, I was elected governor, not dictator, so I don't have the ability to actually go and, and release bills from the committees. That's the leadership of each of those chambers, and so it wouldn't be a bad idea to maybe petition them and say, listen, get this out to the floor for a vote. I think it has wide support. I don't know what, what you think, but I think th those bills probably have, have good support, and, and it's, they certainly are worthy of a good, healthy public debate. 
Um, but the, the answer really lies in getting the people directly in charge, the committee chairs and the leaders of each of the chambers, to get those things out. This is a question actually for anybody on the um, panel. It's my impression that at least 90% of the people in this uh, room have been already sold when they're against gerrymandering, and the block is getting those two um, chairs, one in the House and one in the Senate, Metcalf and mm -hmm. um, the other guy. <laughs> have any of you guys spoken to these two chairs, and what kind of response did you get from them? Do they know what the material, what the contents of those two bills are? Do they have any understanding of what the bills are trying to the checks and balances that those bills provide. Do they understand that? And what's their attitude about it? Thank you. I have um, spoken with Senator Fulmer several times. He actually is very open to the idea of redistricting reform. He believes it needs to happen. Um, there seem to be some political challenges with the leadership within the Senate that we're hoping to find a way to move through. But he certainly has read the bill in great detail, um, has a lot of thoughts about specifics within the bill and is interested in seeing this process move forward. In the House, it's a very different dynamic. Um, the chair of that committee has um, made it incredibly clear that he does not intend at any point to read the bill, to think about the bill, to entertain conversation about the bill. It doesn't matter that 102 of his colleagues have co-sponsored the bill or that people within his committee have requested that he hold a hearing. It doesn't matter that he has a constituent who has showed up at his office at least 15 times now personally asking for a meeting to discuss it, he refuses to even respond. So to me, that's a place where shame is very appropriate. Um, I have personally gone into his office numerous times to ask to speak with him. I've emailed him. There is no response wow. from him to anybody, including his colleagues. To me, that's, that's unconscionable. And anybody who allows that to continue, I would say um, either has no leadership ability at all or doesn't understand what democracy looks like. The petition is for legislation to start the process of the constitutional amendment. The way we amend the state constitution requires the state legislature in two separate sessions, such as 2017-2018, that's one, and 2019-2020, that's two. They have to approve it twice. Then it goes to a public referendum. Uh, and then after that, if it's approved, then we have a constitutional amendment. It's about a three-year process, so we have to start it now. time I watched the redistricting process, the, the people who did it, their tools were pencils, uh, yellow legal tablets, uh, pocket calculators, and voter registration. What has changed over the 40 years are all the software programs that are now out there using GIS systems. We tend to think that this is something that has been going on since 1812 when Governor Elbridge Gerry signed the, uh, the first gerrymandering act. But it has really evolved to a point where there are more specific districts, there's more opportunity to draw districts or gerrymandered than has ever existed uh, before in our democracy. And there are maps. It is not all that difficult to do maps. Anybody with a software program could do it very quickly. And virtually every one that we could do would be better than the ones that we have right now in Pennsylvania. So you're absolutely correct. There are programs and they can be used and they should be. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Jonathan Marks. I'm the Commissioner of the Bureau of Commissions, Elections, and Legislation at the Pennsylvania Department of State. And uh, our role, our function in all of this is really one of uh, being a resource. Uh, we, um, being the agency that oversees the statewide voter registration database uh, and also collects maps uh, of precinct boundaries from county election offices, we're kind of, uh, I guess, the term I would use is middleman. Um, and, and we try to promote transparency so that not only the General Assembly, the legislature uh, has access to the information, but also, uh, also voters. And Somebody has to decide. So, so what are the parameters? So right now, the maps that we have were drawn by computer, and what became incredibly clear in the lawsuits that have played out recently is that the top priority well, the very top priority was never mentioned in court, which was to give the top advantage to one party. But the second top priority was discussed very freely and unapologetically, which was to protect incumbents and to make sure incumbents had, 
had districts that kept them in office. There was no apology about that. And then there are the other, the other parameters. So it's really important that the people who are determining what the computers do have, a, have, a, have the best interest of voters at heart rather than the best interest of politicians, which is why we're asking for an independent commission. It will still be done by computer. It will always be done by computer unless we get some other invention we haven't thought of, but, um, but there need to be people overseeing the process, and those people should not have the conflict of interest of wanting to keep themselves and their friends in office. Well, the Supreme Court ruling did not really solve all the problems that need to be solved. Uh, the Supreme Court ruling uh, simply dealt with the uh, congressional level, the U.S. congressional level, uh, and it did not deal uh, with the state uh, House and the state Senate districts at all. Uh, in addition, we don't know what's going to happen to that uh, Pennsylvania Supreme Court ruling. It might stand, it might get appealed to the U.S. Uh, Supreme Court. So it's not a long-term, for sure, answer. Uh, we think it's a good idea. We hope it'll make things better. But Kevin, I'm on the faculty here at St. Joe's. Uh, the Constitution gives us the right to vote. And the Supreme Court of the United States declared that that right to vote is not just an ordinary right, it's a fundamental right. <coughs> and the right to vote includes the right that our votes count. Yes. And our votes do not count when maps are drawn in such a way to assure that one party or another party is going to prevail in an election. So my comment is very brief that the right to vote includes the right that your vote count. And in the current situation, my vote, I'm in that district where me and is, does not count. Thank you. Better, but uh, what we're proposing is a constitutional amendment to create a citizens commission. The citizens commission would be nonpartisan. Uh, and would take on the job of developing fair districts for the state. We'll close it out with the governor. Hi, governor, and hello to the rest of the panel. Thank you for coming to St. Joe's today. Um, my name is Avery Maloney. I'm a senior, and I'm a political science major at St. Joe's. I'm also a Pennsylvanian, lifelong Pennsylvanian. I live in Montgomery County in Bluebell and in the 13th district. Um, and although my family is split by partisanship, uh, where my uh, parents tend to be more Republican and me and my siblings tend to be more Democratic, we both agree that just, like after this process happens, what really needs to be done is that we need to have an independent commission to draw the district lines. Um, because although my family is very happy with our representation, both in state government and in Congress, I don't think most of the state of Pennsylvania is that, help, that um, happy with their representation in uh, government. Um, so, yeah, in the future, after this process happens, we definitely need to pursue an independent uh, commission uh, forcefully. But I'd also like to say that during this process, a lot of people have been talking about the competing values of gerrymandering and of redistricting and of what um, serves citizens and constituents the best. I, would find, I find that a lot of the districts around here are at least fairly competitive, but I don't think it's serving our area very well. Um, I don't think my county is being represented very fairly in Congress or in um, state, represent, state government, and so I would ask that the, the districts be drawn so that they're more representative of the wishes of the, and the interests of the citizens in those districts. Thank you again. Now, these maps and where these lines fall. Uh, one of the things that matters to me is understanding that we have a shared value with folk in the House, the Senate, and the Congress, so we can get stuff done. And that's, there's another word that we insert in the middle, but get stuff done. And, and, and why that is important is because you can have conflict. I, I represent an eclectic district. It goes all the way up to Swarthmore, that's my boundary. Um, and I've learned how to be a um, environmentally sensitive uh, council person. Had to learn about the spotted owls and the horned toads that once a year traverse right across the road that we, we guard them. But also, I represent some of the poorest areas uh, in the city of Philadelphia, from Market Street to Main Street. But what is important to me is as my state delegation shares a map with me and my, my colleague on over here represents another part of my district that we work together uh, in a common purpose for uh, the folk that we represent. 
Um, Delessio works really hard. I work with her. I listen to her. But no line can keep you safe. The price you pay as an elected official for the space you occupy is service. So when we went through um, uh, redrawing our district, I got a, I had five divisions in North Philly. I'm a West Philly kind of guy, but I had to learn the North Philly values very quickly. But if you get out and work, that's your security. It's not drawing a good old guy's lines that protect you. Working with people do. So um, I hope in our evolution, uh, as we draw lines that we pick people that don't mind talking to people and working for people. And if we do that, you know, they can represent whatever constituency and, and um, I'm looking forward to the new lines. So it does trickle down to uh, the city council. And one provision that we have is if we don't draw those lines at a certain fiscal cliff, we don't get paid. So those lines get drawn. Different mentality today. It seems it seems challenging. I don't want to say hard because the only thing hard is the concrete that we walk on. Everything else is a challenge. So so I'm ready. I'm ready for this challenge. And I was built. I was built for this. I think that we all have a purpose in life. And mine is going to take on a task that most that most of back away from that impossible, impossible. Some people, say, people it's say it's impossible I see possibilities I don't see anything, I don't see anything as being impossible, impossible.